Don't gamble with your dog's life. If they're undergoing surgery, you need to know if they're at a high or a low risk of dying under anesthesia. It's the worst case scenario for everyone involved and this is what you need to know. So we have some really good figures involving high numbers of dogs. One UK study which looked at 150,000 dogs showed that there were 14 deaths per 10,000 procedures. 10 of those per 10,000 were within 48 hours of that procedure. So are definitely likely to be due to that sedation, that anesthetic, or that surgical procedure. Now clearly this is going to depend on the health of your dog to begin with and also the type of surgery that they're going to have. So for neutering surgeries in dogs, our desexing, our spay neuter, then the risk is much smaller than this 10 in 10,000. It's actually down at one death per 10,000 neutering procedures. And this is 0.01%. Now those that did die, there were two following castration and six following ovario hysterectomy. So that then is related to the, the degree of difficulty of that surgery. Although we think of a spay and ovario hysterectomy as a fairly routine procedure, and I'm certainly doing them every week, sometimes every day of the week, they are a routine in inverted commas procedure. They are quite involved, and certainly for our less experienced vets, that is a bit of a, a hurdle to jump through to get comfortable in that procedure. But compared to a castration, much simpler procedure, and this clearly reflects on the fact that the risk is much lower. Now, of those dogs that did die following a, a neuter or desexing procedure, 60% of those had an ASA score of one or two, and 40% had scores of three. And I'll come on to what that means in just a little bit. It's also worth noting that there's actually no association seen in this study between the age of the puppies at the time of neuter and their risk of death. Now, we should be desexing them, spaying, neutering them at a very young age is a topic for another day. Certainly the, the old fashioned uh, six months is the routine recommendation is, is not applicable anymore. And in my mind, we shouldn't be doing them younger than six months for any reason, apart from maybe if they're in a shelter situation and they want to be absolutely certain they're not going to be contributing to overpopulation. A story for a different day, like I say. But the other thing to note is that the stud a study of another big group of dogs that happened the previous decade had a reported death of much higher, of 0.17% uh, risk of death. So that compares to a 0.01%. So it's fair to say that probably we're a little bit further on again from that 150,000 dog study. So the, the, the risk of death is likely even less. Again, as monitoring equipment improves, as our drugs improve, as our training and overall staff involvement also improves. But it's all very well and good thinking what that risk is for our, our routine procedures. But what about if your dog is going through something more involved, something less common? What happens if they aren't as healthy as a, a young animal who's had no medical complaints? Well, we're lucky here again because we have figures from multiple different countries as well. So Spain, Argentina, France, the UK, the USA, Chile, Portugal and Australia kind of pooled and they looked at the health of the individual dog and their risk of dying. So this is where the ASA score comes in. So this is our way of classifying kind of the, the overall health of our surgical patients and then the risks of anesthesia to them. So our ASA 1 individuals are completely healthy patients. There's nothing wrong with them. They are perfectly normal in tip top health and they have a risk of dying of 0.08 percent. So that's one in 1,250 surgical procedures. Moving on to our ASA2 dogs. So these are suffering from mild systemic, so whole body disease that is generally very well controlled. So we're even thinking about controlled diabetes here, but it could be that they are very young, they're very old, or they are obese. And this is actually a pretty important one because obesity is such a common problem in our pet dog population that actually 60% of dogs are going to be classified as ASA2 
just because of their weight. And here, the risk of dying did increase. It went up to 0.24%. So that's one in 416 surgical patients. As health deteriorates, we move up the scale to ASA3. So these are dogs with um, obvious whole body systemic diseases. So that could be anemia. It could be a low grade heart disease. It could be a degree of dehydration. There could be some liver disease present. And that increases the surgical risk of death to 1%. So one in every hundred dogs. And then as things get even worse, we move to ASA4, where we've got severe systemic disease that is a constant threat to life. So that clearly says that these dogs are not healthy. They're actually in a pretty bad way. And you can understand here that their risk of dying is going to be a lot more. We're thinking about advanced heart disease, uh, uncontrolled diabetes, emaciation, um, end stage liver or kidney disease. And here, Unsurprisingly, the risk is 6.5%, so one in 15 dogs. These guys are not going to be having surgery unless it's for a life-threatening condition where the risks of not carrying out that surgery significantly outweigh the risk of having that anesthetic and surgical procedure performed. And I guess this is a good time to, to actually think about that risks benefit because no matter what your dog's health, we never want to be doing unnecessary procedures, procedures that either aren't going to benefit their health in the short or the long term or where the risks outweigh that benefit. So if we have a very tiny benefit, but the risk risk is kind of fairly significant, that's definitely something where we want to be questioning whether it is the right decision. There's lots of times where this comes up. It's typically with our older animals and maybe getting that dental procedure. Now, if they're otherwise healthy, they're probably only going to be in an ASA you know, two, maybe they'll be one. If we delay that procedure though, and we wait for them to stop eating, for example, then they're going to be a higher ASA score. The risks are going to be higher. And so it's much better to actually get that done sooner. Equally, if you've got a dog with a growth that is not expected to be life-threatening, then actually having an anesthetic and surgery to remove that tumor may not be in their best interest because the risk of death or significant complications through surgery is actually higher than the benefit that they're going to get. And then the last dog health category, if you like, ASA5. Now these are dogs that are not expected to survive without the operation. So here we're thinking severe trauma, sepsis, so that might be a perforated intestine. Maybe they've eaten something spiky, it's punched a hole in their intestines and they've developed a really nasty sepsis. End stage liver kidney disease that is really impacting their life. Their risk of death is going to be 16%, so that's one in six. Equally without the surgery that is being performed, they're not expected to survive anyway. So here, you know, we really need to be thinking, is it in our pet's best interests? Ultimately, the alternative is likely to be euthanizing them, which isn't always the wrong thing. We need to be thinking about what's best as an overall quality of life benefit for our patient, rather than maybe focusing on the next kind of day or week. And then there are some other really important factors to consider when it comes to the risk of anesthetic death in our dogs. There's a higher risk if the anesthesia and surgery is performed after hours. Um, so middle of the night, unsurprising. Um, I work all day, I'm on call all night, and then I work the next day. If I'm called in at two in the morning and have to perform an emergency surgery, that risk is going to be higher than if I'm performing that same surgery in the middle of the day with my full team around me. Equally, an urgent procedures are associated with a higher mortality rather than ones that are scheduled in advance. There's a 13.6 times odds of dying, irrespective of the actual specific surgery, if it's performed as an urgent rather than a, a scheduled surgery. And also paediatrics, so our really um, kind of young puppies and our geriatric, our senior dogs, also have an increased risk due to surgery, due to anesthesia. And then obesity, again, is a risk factor for mortality, irrespective of otherwise body health. But regardless of your dog's ASA score, regardless of what surgery they need, why they're being anesthetized, there are ways of reducing the risk of experiencing complications or even dying while under anesthesia. And you can dive into these in this video. So tap on that video. I'll see you there. But until the next time, I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex. This is Our Pets Health, because they're family.